your time maximum of 10 minutes. <laughs> 10 minutes. I will show you. <laughs> sure, no problem. Well, thank you very much for, the, for, for this invitation to discuss uh, Sepo's talk. I, I think he has, a, he has made an excellent presentation on, on an important topic. Um, the link between financial liberalization and, uh, and economic crisis uh, management. Um, now, the, as you saw, the Nordic countries, um, they provide a rich experience both for developed and emerging countries. Um, for, for developed countries, since, well, as you know, they do have a pretty high level of income per capita. Uh, they have, I think, more important than that, or totally connected, they have a very advanced institutions. And uh, I, I find hard to believe that uh, when you're facing a crisis and when you're talking about financial liberalization, issues such as uh, financial inclusion or the quality of institutions are um, irrelevant. Um, but they're also important in terms of the potential lessons for developing countries, for emerging economies. Um, and there are several reasons. Um, I'm gonna show you some figures, but there are several things that are, are similar in in the Nordic countries with these emerging economies. I'm thinking about the size, and I'm gonna be more precise in a few minutes in terms of GDP. Um, I'm also thinking about uh, uh, the fact that these countries to some extent are kind of exotic, uh, like the Latin American countries are, uh, in the sense that they are perceived as different. Um, and with differences, uh, you have more liberty, more freedom to do things, but at the same time, you have this feeling of abandonment uh, I'm going to try to be precise uh, about this about, and about how important I believe it is for policy implications in a few, in a few minutes. Now, since I don't have a lot of time, and I like to talk, so for me 10 minutes is nothing, uh, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me basically mention that, uh, and since this is not a mystery novel at the same time, let me just in one line uh, stress what I think is my, my, my most important point. Um, Maybe I should say that if, if really bad things, and when I say bad things, I'm thinking about policy mistakes and market mistakes, happen in the Nordic countries, they can happen anywhere in the world, okay? So I'm gonna try to be precise about what that uh, implies in terms of uh, policy implication and the type of concern which you have. Especially since you're talking about uh, high human capital and very, very advanced institutions, like the one that you find in other countries, imagining countries with low income per capita, low human capital, and bad institutions as, or at least imperfect institutions, to be more polite, as you find in Chile or in Vietnam. So let's talk about that in a few, in a few minutes. Now, before, before starting, and since I'm coming from Chile and I'm, uh, I have the perspective of the Latin American countries with a focus in Chile, uh, let me show you some, uh, just some, a few figures that uh, compare the Nordic countries and, uh, and some of these Latin American countries that I'm referring to. So, just in 14 seconds. Um, several years, I don't want to start a discussion. I have Argentina and Brazil, to be not so chauvinist, but I'm gonna just talk about Chile. Um, go to the last column, to your right, 2013, um, size, None of these countries is really large. I mean, none of these countries, let's uh, leave Brazil uh, aside, is even 1% of GDP in the world. I'm trying to say that we're not so important. No matter how rich we are, we're not so important for the rest of the world um, in terms of size. Uh, the second thing, go to the second panel of, the, of my slide. Uh, of course, the Nordic countries are much richer than, uh, say, Chile. Uh, even today, at least twice as rich in terms of GDP per capita. The third thing that I want to say from this table is that when we're going to compare crises, like the ones they had in the 90s in the Nordic countries, in the early 90s, look at, these are current dollars numbers, but I mean, you, 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 see, you see what my point is. Um, they were rich enough at, at that time, at least in comparison to the rest of the world in those years. Uh, the crisis in Latin America happened in the early 80s. So it happened when these countries were much poorer. And as I said before, it's gonna be very different to face a, a large crisis, especially a financial crisis, when you have a lot of challenges that you don't have when you're rich. And when with not being rich implies to have bad institutions at the same time, and credibility has a, something to say about these things. Now, just two figures, two, two pictures, and then I, I, I go to my talk in the, in the last seven minutes. Um, so the, 
the crisis that uh, Seppo was referring to happened in the, the crisis happened in, uh, in the Nordic countries in the early 90s, in Latin America in the early 80s. I just called T two years before the crisis, 1980 for Latin America, the dot line uh, for the three countries that I mentioned, I'm referring to Chile now specifically, and uh, the straight line for the Nordic countries, at least the one that Seppo was referring to, where T is 1989. Just, I don't want to get into the discussion. So see what happened in T plus two where the crisis started, um, either in 1982 in Latin America or 1991 in the Nordic countries, you see this huge fall. I mean, these are drops in GDP of uh, something close to 15 percent. We were talking about this yesterday. Um, now, in Chile, the, the, the crisis was even more, more, more deep, more intense, right? It was deeper than, uh, the, than the one that you found in the Nordic countries. But what I, what I like about this picture and what I think we need to concentrate in is the fact that we have three things here that we should concern about and that may have different policy implications or at least have to do with different issues. Three things, or three phases if you want. The first one is what happened before the crisis. So we can discuss about what incubates a crisis. And uh, of course to have good policies is going to be important. I'm going to try to mention that uh, for me, the key, I just destroyed this, I hope I don't need to pay it. Uh, for me the key thing when you're incubating the crisis and you don't know the crisis is coming is the fact that uh, some similar things are happening all over the world, no matter how rich, how dark your skin is, or uh, how much money you have. And the fact that you have a, a lot of, uh, something happening in the financial sector, a lot of credit is going on and so on. And suddenly, you have the gray line, the crisis, bad thing happens. There's a shock, shocks do happen, and the crisis uh, is triggered. That's the second part which may be different from the previous one, is connected, but it's a different issue, it's a different paper. And the third part is what happened after the crisis. Here, I, I'm going to try to say that what happened before the crisis is very similar in the Nordic countries and in Latin America and in the U.S. and so on. The crisis, uh, there can be all kinds of shocks, but I mean, at the end, you have a shock, something bad happens, uh, you have a fixed exchange rate, you made a macro mistake, and uh, you need to liberate, uh, you have, a, you have a problems of credibility, and then things go wrong. Or maybe something wrong happened overseas. Maybe the US, uh, URSS uh, disappears and you have problems with your exports. Or maybe you have a German unification and you have problems with your interest rate. Or maybe Reagan is in charge of the US and raises interest rates. And you, have, but, uh, you had a lot of debt before and with flexible interest rate in Latin America. And then you need to use all your export to pay the, just the service of the debt. But what is also interesting, and this is the third paper, is what happened after is the recovery. Because as this picture shows, recoveries can be very different. Um, I'm going to just show you one picture in a few seconds. And I think the recovery also has a lot to do with the decisions that you make. And that's a lucky thing. I'm not so sure that the first part, the incubation of the crisis, is something we can control. I'm going to finish with that line in a few minutes. Uh, I don't have a lot to say about the, the trigger. We can talk about what you were talking about, problems, micro problems. But I think the recovery is something we have a lot to say. Let me just mention that, and this is based on the kind of things I have worked on, that uh, productivity is going to be Productivity is going to be key in the recovery. The kind of decisions that you make that allow the market to adjust after the huge initial cost are going to have to do mostly with productivity all over the world and also sometimes labor, as it happened in Finland. Uh, and, and then when the, when the recovery is, is the right one and you did the right things and you learn from the lessons, you are in a fantastic picture like this one when you have the Nordic countries, but even better, I'm sorry to be so aggressive, Seppo, but just you can defend yourself, uh, but even better in Latin America. Look, I mean, this is just fantastic. These poor countries that face the worst crisis in 100 years and nothing happens there. This is 2008. All of them are 100 in 2007. So Chile is just growing like crazy in the middle of the second worst crisis in, in, in the, in the post-industrial revolution era. And this, happens, this has to do with the kind of things you decide to do after the original crisis, what you learn enough from, from those experiences. Okay, so let me start my presentation. I have 10 minutes then, right? No, just kidding. <laughs> now I'm starting my presentation. <laughs> I know, I know, two minutes, imagine. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Anand. <laughs> okay, so... Just a few comments. I mean, come on. I mean, this is a lot of material. Uh, I was reading uh, Seppo's papers. They're really interesting. I mean, the experience in the 80s and in the 90s and so on. Um, so I'm going to just focus on a few things to try to stress uh, a few messages. But then we can maybe have a very broader discussion uh, during the 30 or 40 last minutes. Um, 
And you're going you're gonna to see this by yourself. I mean, not much to say here. Basically, I already mentioned what I wanted to mention. Everything, a, a lot of agreement with respect to what happens before the crisis, ex post, of course. I like the quote by Christine Lagarde uh, from the IMF from 2011. All financial crises, she doesn't say in advanced economies, all financial crises are brought about by the same circumstances. Easy money, so a lot of credit. Uh, slack regulation. Regulators didn't do their job, and optimism, blue skies thinking. I like that. I think that happens in uh, the fact. I mean, it's so amazing to because if you tell me this is going to happen in Chile, I can see that. Uh, but if you tell me it's going to happen in the Nordic countries with the human capital and good institutions they have, I think, wow, this is a powerful thing, uh, and we need to to accept that and see why that happens, even if you have such a different uh, institutions in these two type of countries. Um, there, just one second, there you have an example of uh, the same uh, uh, incubation of the problem, the same shock, but then very different recoveries in the early 80s. These are two countries, Mexico and Chile, with terms of trade shocks. One exports only oil, the other one copper. All of them go, both of them go down 15%. Look at the difference since then. In one case, and I don't have time to talk about this now, the resolution of the banking problem. Both of them had fixed exchange rate, by the way. Both of them have the, the speculation against exchange rate. Both of them were small open economies because, I mean, there's an oxymoron if you're going to talk about exchange rate and you have all kinds of restrictions to the capital market. Then, I mean, you are closer. If you are a small open economy with a fixed exchange rate, uh, I mean, we learned the first day in the first macro class that you were not supposed to do anything with the monetary policy. I'm just, I'm just uh, making an extreme comment. So, uh, but these countries did that, and then they had the attack, the speculative attack, and you see the result. What was important is the resolution. In Chile, after a 15% drop in output, after four years after that, 1985, the whole financial system was healthy. Uh, we should talk about what happened there in terms of the way you use the market, the way that you provide some relief to the, to the, de to the lenders and the, and the borrowers, but relief in the short term doesn't mean forgiveness in the long run. Uh, we can talk about that in one second. Just two more lines, uh, two more slides, please. Uh, so, so, my, so, so basically, I think that, uh, what, and I'm going to try to connect this to what uh, to what yesterday uh, Basu was saying in his plenary talk uh, when we started this conference. When we started this conference, uh, I believe that uh, at the end, standard economics explains well how the crisis unfolded, uh, the incubation of the crisis, and the crisis itself. We have learned a lot about that, about bad shocks and about bad, about macro policy mistakes. Um, we know also that there was a lot of risk exposed, um, and we also understand the recoveries. But uh, what we don't understand very well is why countries like Chile, Mexico, uh, the U.S., and the Nordic countries have in common the fact that they ex expose end up accepting so much risk. That's something that we don't understand. Uh, there are people like Schleifer that claim that, and this is why I was talking to Bas, uh, about Basu, think that the only way to do this to, is to incorporate other science, social sciences like psychology and try to understand what happens in our brain. Um, I think it's beautiful when you compare, again, a country like Chile and, and say, Denmark uh, and Finland. They're so different, so different. Uh, and at the same time, we do make exactly the same, I shouldn't say stupid mistakes, ex post, ex post. Um, now, if you, if you don't like to bring the psychologists here, we can think as a traditional economist and bring our problems uh, with imperfections like agency problems or political economy problems. And I think we need to talk about these issues in order to try to understand what the policy lessons are. One more slide and you finish. Uh, we talked yesterday night when we were having the beautiful party uh, about this. Um, so, and he mentioned that separate today. There is a fifth Nordic country, which is Iceland, and there are some interesting things to learn about Iceland, especially since Iceland is so small and it's exotic, and, and I finish in one second, uh, uh, and the fact that uh, the fact that at least exposed, you realize that no matter how important macro is, no matter how important to understand shocks is, at the end, I believe that even though it's not sufficient, a clearly, clearly necessary condition has to do with a strong and strict financial supervisory authority, uh, with a strict prudential regulation. That's something that you cannot, you cannot forget. Um, let me, let, me, let me finish, you see, my last, my last slide. Just, as I said before, um, so that we can may, maybe, maybe uh, talk a little bit further about the things uh, during the next few minutes when you ask your questions. Um, I, 
I believe that we do understand the key precondition, the strict prudential supervision. I think it's important to talk about the market. You mentioned that recoveries are important, but at the end, at the end, uh, I, I believe, and I could be wrong, I just want to try to, to, to motivate the discussion, that given that these so different countries face the same problem exposed that has to do with this excessive risk taking, if we really want to face this, we need to consider seriously to accept the trade-off of losing part of the contribution of these financial institutions in growth and making them simpler. Um, I don't see another way until somebody teach me something different. Uh, I believe that we need to move, and this is my final comment, after we learn what happened in countries like the Nordic countries and the Latin American countries, uh, in terms of facing the same challenges, we need to move in the direction of accepting a second best, which is to have simple financial institutions to force them not to take the risk that they typically end up taking every 10 or 15 years. Thank you very much.